Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. After a two year plus break, the politics of everything has returned with gusto. While so much has changed since my last episode aired in late 2018, some things remain the same. My show speaks to talented, passionate and often untapped people who have experiences we can admire, learn from or relate to. This airspace is a chance to shine a light on my guest stories, dig a little deeper and hopefully give you a few ideas we can all ruminate on. The show clearly does not promote any one political party, issue or belief system. In spite of the name, the politics of everything is more about what people consider to be traditional politics and much more. It's definitely a firm nod acknowledging that every aspect of modern life has a degree of politics weaved into it, but there is a lot more to life than politics. To kickstart the next series, I'm delighted to be bantering with Kylie Green, a marketer, entrepreneur, supporter of women in business, networking champion, charity worker, and a mother of one. She has 30 years plus in her career portfolio, ranging from entrepreneurial marketing and senior management roles. At just 29 years of age, she founded Kaleidoscope Marketing and sold it in 2005 to the Photon Group of companies where she held that position of CEO till mid-2010. From that time to 2012, she founded and ran two businesses, took some time out to start a family, joined the board of directors for Lane Beachley's Aim for the Stars Foundation and worked as an industry mentor to several industry business owners in marketing, creative services and PR. As the pandemic that won't be named gripped the planet last year, the ever-fearless Kylie has recently launched her fourth business, The Lime Agency, specialising in talent management and brand partnerships. And in the interest of full disclosure, I'm one of their vetted experts working as a media trainer and PR strategist for their clients. Prior to Lime, Kylie was MD of Kimberlin Education for two years and spent some time with Women in Focus, ComBank's very famous entrepreneurial female leadership group. She's been an MD more times than I've probably had coffees and she knows everything there is to do about rebranding, marketing and pivoting. Welcoming Kylie is like welcoming into my podcast home one of the most savvy, accomplished people I know who share similar values to me and a love of the equestrian lifestyle. Kylie has been a sounding board and connected to purpose-filled experiences in my life and a cherished friend for over a decade. Welcome to the podcast, Kylie. Thank you so much, Amber. What a wonderful introduction. I really appreciate that. No, it's it's very hard to sum you up in such a short period of time, but I am keen to get to the good stuff. Thank you. I am too. So starting back many years ago, growing up, did you always want to work in the glamorous advertising business or did you dream of something different? Actually, at school, I always dreamt of working in advertising or being a veterinarian. Um, There's a funny story behind both of those. Well, I had a love of uh, horses especially um, and a love of animals, and I did work experience um, during the school holidays at a veterinary uh, a vet clinic and um, my allergies that got the better of me. So I sort of decided I don't think the life of a veterinarian is for someone who suffers from allergies and, and being allergic to animals. Um, but I still had the vision and then I also worked, wanted to work in advertising and I didn't really know a lot about the advertising industry other than watching Melrose Place and thinking it was so glamorous with Heather Locklear being working in an ad agency. Sparks <laughs> had lots of disposable income and seemed to uh, socialise more than they work. They did, they did. But at at the time, um, back in the 80s when I was in high school, my careers advisor didn't really know a lot about the advertising industry. So when it came to doing selections for colleges and things, she was suggesting things like a photographic course or, you know, a a creative course. And I, I really wanted to be on the business side of it, but she didn't really understand. So I applied for vet science um, in my trials, I did do very well in my in my HSC score, but unfortunately, my best friend passed away, and uh, my HSC results suffered as a result. So, 
here I was um, after finishing school thinking, do I repeat the year or do I just go out into the business world? And my dad being um, one of my mentors suggested that um, I, I start working straight away and studying at night. So I actually started um, in an accounting firm, which I loathed and hated, but the accounting obviously went in good stead for my business acumen. And um, I used to flick through the yellow pages every lunchtime looking for advertising agencies and writing to them. So I did end up, um, after a year of accounting, landing my first job in an agency in Sydney as an assistant accountant. And that's where my career started from there. Fantastic. So that marketing and business world has changed so much in three decades. And I almost think the three decades before was a little bit more static than it has been perhaps since you started your career to where we are now. Our topic today is politics of collaboration. It is a bit of a buzzword, but why do you think it's so important that people collaborate, particularly in the industry that you're working in? Um, collaboration is, um, you know, something that I've always done freely. Um, but back in the early days in my career, it, it felt very uncomfortable um, back then because of, you know, closed doors and competition and things like that. And, and I think everyone was really scared that someone would steal a client or steal an idea or even steal a staff member and so on. So there was a lot of fear around it. So I'd learned a little bit about it in my first couple of agencies, but I saw how not to do it. And then I think when I started my own business at 29, I had to adapt and I had to collaborate because I was on my own and I didn't feel that I had the experience to actually run an agency. But my dad, even though he's from a different um, industry, was always like, just go out on your own, have a go, have a go. And so he started his first business at 19. And so I um, was fortunate enough that I had parents that were really supportive and got behind me. So at 29, um, I had to use freelancers and collaborate with others, you know, that I knew and some people that I didn't know um, to really help me get my business off the ground. Interesting. So because you have outsourced probably most of your career, you also need to have a handle mm -hmm. on what people are doing. Do you feel like you need to constantly upskill each time you have a new business to keep ahead of the pack? Do you feel like your skills and your knowledge, it's important to sort of know more than you just know, even though you're an expert, obviously, in what you do? How do you actually go about making sure you, you're really on, on top of your game for each, each business that you're running or you're starting? Yeah. I, I look back and think change is really the only constant and the industry like you said has changed so much um, in the 30 years that I've been in the industry I mean funny I was when I was thinking about your questions I was thinking back to my first agency and back then the creatives actually were illustrators and we didn't have computers to do the creative um, we so you know and then we said we were introducing computers and you should have seen the uproar with the creatives going, oh, I'm, you know, I'm too old to learn computers. I don't want to change. I don't. And I said, it's the future. You've got to do this. And we trained everybody on this. And it took a long time, but it was more that getting over that fear of something new and something different, and it wasn't going to take away your job. So um, it was really interesting going through that back then. But I've, I find that I don't know everything and I love learning and I and where the, the chance every chance I get I'll do short courses or I'll ask somebody to t show me something or I you know young people today teach me how to do this teach me how to do that so I am um, I love to learn and adapt but I don't profess that I know everything and in fact I'm even doing a course tonight an online course tonight in social media just so I can get new skills and learn new things um, but, uh, but I learn from other people and that's, that's, you know, what the big thing about collaboration is that when I'm collaborating with people, I'm learning and they're learning something from me. So it's like that two way street. Absolutely. And I don't think the hierarchy matters just because you've got 30 years and they've no. got five. I, I'm always blown away that if I take the time, I can really learn something that perhaps I hadn't even considered before. And that's also my ethos in business. Like when, um, I get a lot of people saying, uh, especially when I've run big agencies, you know, like I, I, I deserve that promotion because I've been here the longest. And I go, it's not about entitlement. It's about who is the best person with the right skills. And I've promoted people that have got, you know, two or three years experience under their belt because they were the better person for that promotion than someone that had probably has been there, you know, five, 10 years. So it has nothing to do with your age, nothing to do with how long you've worked in a, in a place it's all about your skills and whether those skills match what the person's looking for. Absolutely. 
Just going a bit more into the tools of, of, I guess, collaboration and marketing your expertise, have you had the experience where some digital campaigns arguably work better with just that one agency versus that team of experts from different businesses? Because I suppose it's about time management, efficiencies, resources, and also the relationships in that collaboration. If you've got people in sites, yes. that can be challenging too if you're the head of that project. Is there any examples that come to mind where you think, oh, it's definitely a one agency job versus, you know, I need to find the best sound editor or the best illustrator for this gig? Yeah, look, quite often you'll find um, agencies often do outsource for various skills when working on any client campaign um, versus having it all in-house. But obviously full-time staff are the biggest overhead of any agency. So it depends on the size of your agency. Um, But clients these days, they don't expect you know, their agencies to have everything under the one roof, like big flashy offices and a a horde of people working for them. They want great client service, clever strategy and game-changing creative ideas. And that can be delivered by a team or one person with a collaborating team around them. Um, I think the only thing to be mindful of is when you have it all under one roof that you really have to control or you have more control and you have more visibility, um, whereas when you're outsourcing your experts can come from, you know, multiple sort of uh, specialised areas. Um, And most of those people are running their own businesses as well, whether they be a freelance one person on their own or they have a small team. But they do understand deadlines and deliverables. So it can work both ways. It's just just whether or not you have the right people on your team if if you've got them all under the one roof. Um, I've had experiences where I've had big teams and uh, we were pitching – on a client that we didn't have the experience on. But, you know, people often say, I've had a client say to me once, um, we sell pet food and um, do you have any pet food experience? I said, no, I don't, but I've sold lots of other things in the FMCG space (laughs) that, that the consumers buy. They don't just buy pet food. They're buying bread. They're buying orange juice. They're buying, you know, nappies. They're buying whatever because they're consumers of multiple brands, not just one brand. And, um, you know, and I, I would say I have a dog as well. So I do I do understand I'm a pet food buyer myself. So, you, you know, you don't. Did you get over those allergies, Kylie? Yeah. That's a non-allergenic dog. <laughs> oh, good. Yes, we have those. Uh, yeah. But, um, but, yeah, so I think that you don't have to know it all and you don't have to have experience. But uh, going back to agency, sometimes I've hired experts in an area where, and brought them in to do the pitch and the campaign with a team for that very reason, to have that extra bolster of the experience that we didn't actually have. And then once we won that client, we were on our way. That's interesting. Yeah, so it can work both ways. I guess um, looking at some of the downsides perhaps of collaboration, I mean, it would be great if it was all perfect and blue sky sailing. (laughs) Has there been times where it's been a clear disadvantage for you either in business or in your career? Any examples that come to mind? Absolutely. I'm I'm always a believer that, you know, sometimes you need to fail to succeed and I learn you learn from your failures, right? Um, and not no one out there can say that it's worked perfectly every time and especially me. Um, the disadvantages, I think that, you know, not all people are open collaborators. That's the first thing. And you've got to understand you need all different types of people to be on a team. And you, it's not just the extroverts that you, you want in the collaboration sort of side of things. You've got to understand how to work with all types of people. Trust is paramount and confidentiality as well. Um, and, you know, this, I'll give you two examples of great collaboration and one where it went terribly wrong. Um, a good example of great collaboration was when I was running MKTG, we were asked to be on the pitch, which is um, on the Gruen transfer or Gruen as it's known now. And how that works is two agencies go on to the pitch and they've got a mock brief, so to speak, and you've got to create a TV commercial to go up against each other and one, um, and then the panel choose the winner. So we uh, had to submit three ideas. And so I let everybody on the team, because it was a bit of fun and something a bit different to working on client work day in, day out. But we had to obviously balance it in the agency as well, because we couldn't just drop all our client work to do this fun stuff. No, of course. So, I guess it's a fast <laughs> turnaround and you don't want to spend a lot of budget. Right. You've got to yeah, just you've make got, this happen. You've got to make it happen for pretty much a zero budget. They do give you a little bit of budget, but it's not a big budget at all. So we brought the whole team together and um, 
one of our junior creatives, um, he'd only been on board with us for about three months and he came up with a really great concept, one of the three that we submitted to the show and then the show decided which one they wanted us to create and it was actually the idea of our little junior burger who'd only been on board for three months and anyway he was so excited so we we made the tv commercial and I took my Sydney based team to uh, to be in the audience and um, what they do after the show is they uh, do a recording of how you came about with the idea and all of that and I brought him on camera with me and he was so nervous um, but that you know they're asking us questions and and he was just saying this is a career highlight and it, I'll never forget it and he couldn't believe that we allowed him to be part of the collaboration and then the fact that we backed him with his idea so that's a great example of great how example. great collaboration works and one that's not so good is I won't mention agencies or clients, but um, I was working in a uh, in a big group um, where all the agencies are owned by the same entity, um, but obviously we're all running different businesses, and we were collaborating with an agency that was a bigger agency than us, so it was an ad agency, and we were a below the line activation agency, and it was on an activation for a very very big client of theirs. And um, so the ad agency was doing the, the creative, but we were doing all the back end, all the, the activation. And the activation was involving a um, major installation in a Sydney location. And uh, the creative that the agency kept submitting to us to get approval by the owner of the um, media channel or installation where we were doing it, it just wasn't getting approved. It was just going round and round in circles. And anyway, the ad agency just said, oh, well, the client's going to pull the campaign. And I said, well, we can't because, you know, we're only five weeks out and we'll lose the deposit. And they said, okay, well, it's it's not going to get through. So we we had to cancel. So I invoiced my sister company for the the, uh, fee for the cancellation and um, they refused to pay it. And so here we are in a situation where collaboration has gone horribly wrong and you're trying to bring in... Yes. Someone stuck with the bill too, <laughs> the worst. Yes, yes. And so we were trying to bring in the lawyer for the group as a mediator and that wasn't working. And then they said, there's no way the client's going to pay this. We'll lose the client if we if we charge them. And so it, it basically got thrown back at me and it had to sit on my books. And um, that, that caused a very difficult, challenging situation in the agency. And um, a lot of my team weren't happy about it. But, you know, I'm the leader, so I'm the one that had to, you know, fight for the team. And, um, yeah, so it's it's an example of where it went wrong. And then I look back on that and think, well, why did it go wrong and what? how could we have prevented it? And I think there needed to be a lot better um, collaboration. They, The agency, being very protective of their client, didn't allow us to come to the round right. table to the meetings Filtered, with the client. Yes, so it was all done within the horse's mouth. Know, yeah, filtered, exactly. So that's right, yeah. Interesting. So that's that sort of leads to my next question, which is collaborating means working together clearly, but is there any proof that this makes sense in business when it seems competition is more of a driver in big successful businesses and small thriving businesses too? Like competition and collaboration almost seem at odds. How do you reconcile the two and, and, and have success? Yeah, I think the other thing is too, you've got to keep in mind, are you a, are you the small fish in the big pond and is the person you're collaborating with the big, you know, the big behemoth? So, you know, big agency versus small agency or, you know, big agency versus one person. So you've got to really be clear on when you're doing the collaborating, what's in it for me and what's in it for you and, you know, who controls what because it can go really really horribly wrong and you know you might end up that you you've done all this great collaboration but you don't get paid or you've done this great collaboration and you weren't acknowledged for it or um somebody else says it was their idea and not your idea so I think it's just all about that going back to what I said previously about trust and the confidentiality and making sure that there are uh, you know deliverables in in writing and there's a written agreement as well because I think sometimes lots of things get done verbally and the promises down the track often get broken absolutely I I totally agree with that but I but but I don't want anyone to think oh god I'm never going to collaborate with somebody outside of my business because it nine times out of ten is fantastic it's 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 such a wonderful thing Mm, yes 
It can work. And we've all had those experiences and they reinforce. I think it's very hard because I think it comes down to your personality too. Like I've got people in my industry who I know I can trust and we always have confidentiality agreements and all the things that you need just to really make sure that relationship's preserved beyond the project you're working on. But at the same time, I've been shocked a few times, even recently, all these years in business, just the amount of people that sort of copycat or and you know don't actually don't actually acknowledge that you, you've helped them or any of those things and you think wow that's that's fascinating and I probably won't want to do business or recommend them again mm, that's it that it's happened to me plenty of times as well and I think that's what you learn you learn who you can trust you learn who you collaborate really well with like I, some of the um, experts that I use here at Lime I mean I've been working with some of them for 20 30 years and we've never worked in the same business but we've collaborated many many times because there is that absolute trust and support there and so I think it is about you going out there and and learning who you can work with and who you don't actually work that well with but um, when it works it's brilliant and um, and I, I, I will continue to keep on doing it but I'm still continuing to learn along the way. Absolutely. Changing tack a bit, and this is a bit of fun, I've just added this into my series, is my Mm -hmm. seventh question, which is if you could have just one song, one book or one screen show, that could be a film or a Netflix series or anything you like, Mm. that always makes your heart skip a beat, what would you choose? And it should be just quite a gut feel thing and explain in just a sentence or two why, what it means to you. The first thing I always think of is a book and it was a book that I read I've read many, many times over and I'll never forget it. It's called Who Moved My Cheese? Um, and it's really been my go-to book for life. It's it's an analogy that you can't stay in one spot or keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. And it's a, it's a really easy book to read. You can read it in an hour. And it's a, it's about two little mice that are, you know, find the cheese and one and the cheese runs out and one of the one of the mice goes oh we'll just stay here and wait for the cheese to come again and the, and the other one goes oh i don't think it's coming so the other one goes off looking for more cheese and finds an even bigger you know amount of cheese and sits there and gorges himself on it and the other one's still waiting in the old spot waiting for the cheese to come so it's all about life really it's about some people just stay in the one spot and expect it's going to happen again all over for them and others, you know, they're continually on that journey looking for something and that book is the analogy of my life. That's fascinating and it definitely reflects a lot of your own decision making and I guess your agility to keep keep moving and growing and evolving and never staying in one place for too long. Yeah, absolutely. So who've been the most special mentors in your life? And it could be one or two people. What have they taught you about success and and life more generally? I've got three mentors that have really guided me and helped me throughout my life. My first is my dad, of course. Um, And even though he's passed away now, he's, I can always hear his voice in my ear, just that, you know, that encouragement or the advice. And I miss him terribly, but I just am so grateful that I had him in my life to be a great mentor, um, not just in business, but in life as well. Um, And then my first boss in advertising was um, is Terence Liam Priest, uh, TP, I often call him that. And uh, he's still today a mentor and a friend. He's retired now, but I just learned so much from him about running an agency, but also just he taught me a lot about business relationships and um, and how they can extend into friendship. But he also had a file of facts. I just remember him always writing in his file of facts. Oh, that dates him. <laughs> a file of facts. I remember those. You know what? I still have one today, even with all tech around me. I love having a file of facts in front of me and having that week to view. And every time I look at it, it just reminds me of him. So that was how he rubbed off onto me. And then Liz Courtney. Um, so Liz was... Um, another female, you know, in the business, in below the line marketing, running an agency. And we never worked under the same roof, but we met when we were working on a a committee um, for the industry body. And um, we've just collabed and we were collaborating on the industry body, obviously, to get things done, you know, like for the awards nights or all the events we were putting on and so forth. The glamorous stuff. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, I have to say something about Glamorous in a second, but um, her and I still collaborate today. So she's now off doing other things. She does documentaries and she's a filmmaker, um, but we come together and collaborate all the time and we're, and we're great friends. So those are my, my three um, mentors and I'm, I'm a big um, giver back. I, I mean, I'm, I've mentored a lot of people in my career and I still mentor people today. So I just love um, helping people and giving them back. And you've been one of mine, Kylie. So there you go, a bit of mutual love. Thank you, Amber. 
It's hard work. Absolutely. But thank you. But just back to glamorous. Everyone, I remember growing up, I thought the industry was glamorous. But once you work in the industry, it's a lot of, you know, blood, sweat and tears. It's hard. It's, it's, it's long hours. It's, you, you're always on, um, especially when you're running your own business. The phone rings all day, every day and all night. Um, you know, I remember years ago, I mean, not so much now, but years ago I had to go in the middle of the night to go to printing presses and check, you know, that, that, that the presses were running properly, the colours were all balanced and whatever and, you know, and, and meeting a client deadline, working through the night for that. But And the travel, everyone says, oh, the travel must be glamorous. But I think um, when I left MKTG, I, I recorded that I had travelled, I was away from my family for 172 of the 365 days. So it's a lot when you're travelling and it's not always glamorous. It's sitting in airports and cancelled flights and all of that. Is and, and even though you travel business class, I mean, I used to travel business class, jump off the flight and I don't sleep on planes that well and go straight to work. You know, so you're in different time zones and all of that. And it's not glamorous, but look, we, we have fun and there is a lot that is addictive and we love it and we love the industry for that. Um, but I, the biggest thing I get out of the industry is just the creativeness and the people I get to work with and the brands I get to work with and just creating campaigns, you know, and ideas and things like that. I love it. I'm addicted to it. <laughs> so the final takeaway, what is your best tip for anyone embracing the politics of collaboration? I just think be open to it and be supportive of it. Um, and discover the power of it with um, the incredible outcomes. It can bring out the best in people, the best ideas and the best solutions. And remember, it's just got to benefit everyone that's involved, especially, you know, especially you as a person as well. Absolutely. Well, it's been fantastic to chat to you as my first show back after two Thank and a bit you. years. And Thank you. we will have this with show notes online and all Kylie's socials so you can keep in touch as well. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.